Hello, my name is Allie. I want to share a few things with you just before we jump right into the message. First, be sure to fill out the connection card that's in the seat right in front of you so we can keep in touch. Just drop it off in the offering basket as it comes by. We want to get connected and learn how we can best serve you in the future. Make sure on your way out of service that you grab a few invite cards to hand out to your friends and family that don't have a church home. Let's invite them in and make them feel welcome. Let's grow our church together. Be sure to download our church app to stay up to date. You can read your Bible, get sermon notes, get updates, and get financially right from the app. And it is available to download on the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Follow us on social media. Let's get connected. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Be sure to visit our website at www.redemptioncg.org for more great resources. As we get ready to give generously in just a moment, you can give three different ways. Online at www.redemptioncg.org forward slash give, in the church app, or in the offering. There are envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you. Thank you for watching. We are so glad you are here. Welcome home. Everybody doing well this morning? Good, good, good. Let's, uh, uh, let's take an offering and let's get right into the word. Can we do that this morning? Yes. I love the scripture that says God loves a cheerful giver. And, and, and when we give that word, that word, that word cheerful in, in, in the New Testament just really means hilarious. That's where we get the, it's, it's hilarous in Greek. And it's where we get the word hilarious from. And, and, and I think, I think the expression of the writer there, Paul is saying that God loves a cheerful giver because, because, because we ought to be cheerful about it. He's done, he's done so much for us and, and, and we can give back a portion back to him. And so let's do that this morning. Can we do that? Let's be faithful in our giving this morning. Father, take this tithe and take this offering and bless it. God, so the more people might come to know this Jesus that we love and serve. Bless every gift, bless every giver, press it down, shake it together, make it run over God. And we'll be quick to give you thanks and praise in Jesus name. And somebody said, amen. Bless you this morning as you give. Did y'all enjoy that breakfast this morning? Enjoy that breakfast? Good, good. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalm. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalm chapter 37. Verse 5. Psalm 37, verse 5. And if you'll do me a favor this morning, if you'll entertain me this morning, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Actually, I'm going to go back to verse 3. Psalm 37, verse 3. Your Bible says to trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Father, this morning as we are we're in your word on this Sunday, God, I pray that you'll give us ears to hear what you're saying. God, give us eyes to see what you're doing. And God, give us a heart that's soft and teachable. And I'll be quick to give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And somebody said, amen. You can be seated in the house of God this morning. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit different than, than, than most Easter messages. You're going to find that as your pastor, I am not much of a holiday preacher. And so when it comes to Mother's Day, typically I don't preach a Mother's Day message on Mother's Day. On Father's Day, I typically don't preach a Father's Day message on Father's Day. On Christmas, sometimes I have preached a Christmas message and sometimes I've preached a a total different message. Easter, I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it Easter-ish. Easter, Easter. Uh, but but I believe that there's an overarching theme that God wants us to God wants us to explore this morning uh, that I've been chewing on all week long. And 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 the word I kept getting in my heart is commit. 
the word I kept getting in my heart to commit. And, and, and that word commit is an important word. Um, that we that we are giving ourselves when he says to in verse five when he says commit your way to the lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass what he's saying is to give yourself over to god give yourself to god submit yourself to god uh commit yourself to god i i think i think of pulling it into the easter story i think how committed jesus is to us how much that day on the cross that he was committed to us and how much he is still committed to us i'm thankful that thursday night when he was in the garden and he was before he was betrayed and was praying in the garden of gethsemane when he was praying to his father and he said listen lord let this cup pass from me he knew that he was going to struggle and that he was soon going to be arrested because he was fully god and fully man And he knew the things that were going to come because the prophecies in Scripture in Isaiah told him so. But also being fully God, he knew what was coming, right? It was no surprise to him. It was not a shock to him that he would be arrested and tried and convicted and hung on a cross. It was no shock to him. But still being being man and God, he struggled with the fact but yet he still committed himself to God. And he said, listen, when in that garden, he said something so significant. Listen to me. He said, he said, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. In fact, but before that, he said, Lord, let your, let this cup pass from me. In other words, what he's saying is, Hey, 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 I don't want to have to go to the cross because it's going to be painful. And it's going to be difficult. And it's going to be the hardest thing that I've ever done in my whole ministry. It's going to be the hardest thing, but I'm committing what he was saying then really in his heart was, but I am committing myself, God, to you. And I'm going to commit myself to your plan, even when it's not comfortable. Can I tell you this morning that God's going to have you do some things in his plan that's not going to be comfortable. And if you're looking for a comfortable gospel, I'm sorry, This gospel is not comfortable. In fact, this gospel will pull you out of your comfort zone. And 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 he'll have you and he'll have you do some things and say some things and be some things that you might not always want to. You're going to have to learn how to lay some things down and commit yourself to him. When we live in a when we live in a generation today that says we should change this Bible to match more to, to, to reflect our current our current moral code and our moral standards. When what we need to be doing is changing our moral code and our standards to fit scripture. You see, I have to assume that when something is wrong, something, when, when something is wrong in society, it's society, not God's word. God's word is right and God's word is holy and God's word is perfect. And I need to conform my life to his word, not try to conform his word to my life. And, and so I'm going to have to commit myself to him instead of trying to get him to commit to my plan because my plan won't work. My plan will fail, but God's plan always works. But listen to me, if you don't work God's plan, God's plan won't work. And so we have to, we have to be committed. And I am so thankful that I serve a savior this morning who was committed, who was committed in the beginning, who was committed in the middle and went and was committed all the way through. I can take his promises to the bank. He went all the way to the cross and he was committed. I look at song. I look at, I look at Proverbs. Go with me. Go with me. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. I, I, I like, I like that, that if we commit our, the things that we do, we commit the things to the Lord that we're doing, our thoughts will be established. But pastor, my, my thoughts are, my thoughts are this way and that way. And sometimes I get up and I feel this way. And sometimes I feel this way. And 
and no, I'm committing my thoughts. I'm submitting my thoughts to God. And he's going to establish me. He's going to settle me. He's going to keep me. He's going to help me. I am thankful this morning that my Savior's thoughts were committed towards me. Because do you realize this morning that on the cross of Christ, when he hung on that cross, you were on his mind? Thank you, Jesus. Let that sink in for a second. As he went to the cross, you were on his mind. And all of your past failures and all your current failures and all of your future failures, he was going to die for. Why? Because he was committed to you. He was committed to you and committed to the process and did not give up. Oh my God, how many people today give up? Give up so easy. In fact, ah, I have to come against society again because, because we have so much quit in us. When things get hard, we just quit. When things get hard at work, we just find another job. When things get hard in our marriage, we just find another fish. When things get hard, we just... We got too much quit in us. Instead, we need a little more commit in us. No, okay, my marriage is difficult. I'm going to double down in Jesus' name. I'm either going to double down or I'm going to kill her. One or the other. I'll bury her deep enough where the cadaver dogs can't smell her. Hmm. I am not advocating you burying your spouse. I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating that. But, but, but I have some extra acres next door. For a low fee, we, we will... We could make it happen. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying we could make something happen for an offering. You come to church next Sunday and you see these piles of dirt. What kind of church is this? <laughs> What kind of church is this? And where is Sarah? And where is where's Brittany? And where's Barbara? And where's Frederica? And no, we need to be committed to him because he was committed to us. Go, 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 go. Go, Matthew. Let's go New Testament. Thank you for not saying my name, Pastor. I think I'm just... I was trying to think of some fake names. I was like... Because if you don't come to church on Sunday, they'll be like, uh huh, she's in the field. She's in the field. Hmm. Yeah. Where's Sarah? Ah, go check the field. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16. Hey, if you can't if you can't smile and laugh in church, then you shouldn't be able to laugh anywhere. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that laughter does good like a medicine. And y'all need to learn how to laugh sometimes and just Get over your serious. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. God, these people are weird. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. <laughs> Jesus is talking to his disciples here. In the red letter edition, he says this. Jesus, verse 24, he says, And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What Jesus is asking for is commitment. Because what he's asking for, he said, listen, he needs to take, he needs to deny himself. There's some things y'all that we need to deny ourselves from. Kind of like last night when we were putting together those Easter eggs for your kids. Those Reese's peanut butter cups kept calling my name and I needed to deny myself. I'm not saying I did, but I needed to. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The cross, the cross, the cross is a place of death. 
The cross is a place of sacrifice. The, the, cross, the cross is a place where things go to die. And what he's saying is there's some things that we're going to need to deny ourselves from because they're not good for us. And, and, and we're going to have to learn how to die to some things. Yeah. And, and then we're going to have to learn how to follow him. In other words, he said, what he's asking is he's saying here in, in Matthew chapter 16, he's saying, listen, I want you to be committed. I want you to be committed. I, I, I've thought about this in my own life and maybe yours too is what if God was only committed to us as we were to him? We would be in trouble. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that he doesn't, that he doesn't measure things like that. But, but I have to remind myself, am I committed to him because he was committed to me? And at least I could, I could show my commitment back to him. I could show my love back for him, not out of duty, but out of devotion. See, if you're going to mature, you're going to have to go from you're going to have to go from duty to devotion. Is I don't have to come to church; I get to come to church. Amen. I get to, I, I get to, not just because we get dressed up and we have a breakfast and we and we feed your kids sugar on Easter Sunday, but I want to be in church. There's another place I'd rather be on Sunday morning than to be in the house of God. And can I just tell you something? The church is a messy place. That's right. Not just this church. Every church is a messy church, is a messy place. And we all have our faults and we all have our problems and we all have our idiosyncrasies and our, 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 our messed up self. But you know what? Jesus chose to use the church as the hope of the world. And if you keep your eyes on people, then you'll get hurt. But if you keep your eyes on God, God will change your life and he'll use the church to do it. And so what we need to do is what I'm saying is, yeah, I guess I am kind of saying that we need to be committed to Jesus and we need to be committed to the things that he's committed to. And, and, and he's saying, listen, you're going to have to deny yourself. But pastor, I'm busy. Then you're too busy. Right. I'm too busy to come to, I'm too busy to come to church. Then you're just too busy because he's committed himself to you. What if he would have said, I'm too busy on Thursday night to go to the garden to pray for you. I'm too busy to go to the cross. I've got other things I'd rather do. And I am sure that Jesus had some other things he wanted to do on that Friday morning than to be hung on a cross. He fit himself into his schedule. I wonder, will you fit him into your schedule? I'm just too busy. I got too much going on. Then you have too much going on. Is, is I need to be, I need to be committed. I need to be committed to him. I need to deny myself with some things. Maybe I need to deny myself some overtime at work so I could get to. Thank you, Jesus. I remember when I first, man, when I first got saved, and I know I'm weird, but when I first got saved. Jesus came into my heart. My pastor stood up and he said, listen, you come Sunday morning, you come Sunday night, you come Wednesday night and God will change your life. And I was like, that's a big commitment. I worked Sunday night. I worked Wednesday night. I, I couldn't do men's Bible study on Thursdays. I couldn't, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. I couldn't. The Lord began to deal with me. He said, are you going to commit yourself to me? Yeah. After all, Jesus, you've been committed to me. So I went to my boss and I said, I can't work Sunday nights no more. Hello? I can't work Wednesday nights no more. Back then, back then when simple obedience would take place, like... I remember simple, oh, simple obedience. Remember when your kids were little and they would just obey you because you told them to? Listen, 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 listen. Don't get distracted. Listen, 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 listen. Simple obedience. 
Amen. My pastor said so, so I did it. Amen. Amen. Oh, I got some more to teach there. I think I got some more. I got I got some work to do there because y'all gonna listen. <laughs> so, so I, I I'll never forget. Funny story. He. I just got, I just accepted Jesus as my savior and I was on fire. I was 18 years old. Man, I fell in love with Jesus and I bought the biggest Bible I could find at the bookstore. Lugging this thing to church and he said, all right, it's time to pay your tithes. And I was rich back then. <laughs> working at Golden Corral. Remember that, Steve? One of my high school buddies is here today college buddies working at golden corral making five bucks an hour i was making three hundred dollars a week i was walking in high cotton the pastor get up there and he'd say it's time to pay your tithes and and back then it was in the 90s we wrote checks you know those little pieces of paper thing that you write on and, and, and I, I wrote my check for $30 because that was 10% of my income. And, and I, I, would, I would put it and I'd put it in the offering. And then, you know, pastor said, come Sunday night. So I came Sunday night and he said, it's time to pay your tithes. And I'd say, who Jesus? And I, I'd write a check for $30 because he said, pay my tithes. And 10% of $300 was $30. And so I write my tithes. Wednesday night, he'd say, okay, it's time to pay your tithes. And I'd... This Jesus thing is getting expensive. And I'd write my I'd write my thirty dollar check because ten percent of thirty dollars thirty thousand dollars was thirty dollars, and I'd write my check. And I did this for I don't know six, seven, eight, nine weeks, and and and, and you know, whew, making three hundred dollars a week and tithing ninety dollars a week, and 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 I didn't know no better because because I was committed. Right, that's right. <sighs> And uh, the pastor called me back. So I stopped coming. I stopped going. I stopped coming on Sunday nights and Wednesdays. It just got too expensive. Come on, somebody. So Sunday morning, so Sunday morning after Sunday morning, after a few weeks went by and I wasn't there, he called me in back into the office. It's now my office. And he said, he said, Hey, he said, uh, uh, what do you do for a living, man? He said, you, first of all, I miss you, but you're doing pretty good as a, 18 year old kid, I get the financial reports. And I said, well, pastor, every time you tell me to, to do, I do it. You told me to come Sunday morning. You told me to come Sunday night. You told me to come Wednesday night and I'm here. He's like, I know you have been, you've been missing. Why? I said, cause I can't afford to pay 30, 30% 30 of my income. I thought that man was going to fall on the floor. He lost his mind. He laughed so hard. He said, no, son, just pay 10% of your income. That's all you have. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying to you is your pastor might not be the smartest man, but he's committed. <laughs> I might not be a smart one, but I'm committed. And church, if you're going to, be, if you, if you want, if you want to live a blessed life, you're going to have to learn how to get committed. If you want a blessed marriage, you're going to have to learn how to be committed. If you want blessed kids, you're going to have to learn how to be committed to your kids. If you want that promotion at your job, you're going to have to be committed. Somebody say committed. And if you want God to bless you and bless your life and to move in your life and your heart. You got to be committed. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Let, let me let me give you let me give you one more. Let me and then I'll be done with my introduction. <laughs> Then I'll start my sermon. Is anybody getting anything out of this this morning? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let aside every weight and every sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Excuse me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God on the throne of God. So, so listen, he says, he says this, he says that, he, that we're looking unto Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy was set before him, despising the shame, right, that he would endure on the cross. He sat down at the right hand of God. And so we, we look at this, he was committed. He was committed that he saw that there was going to be some shame and he saw that there was going to be some pain, but God was still committed to the process of going to the cross to die for our sins and to die for our shame. I am thankful this morning that from the beginning of the book to the back of the book, that God was committed to us. And even when we're not, and even when we're not committed, he still is committed. When we fall short, he is still faithful. When we make a mistake, he is still faithful. He is still committed. He's not, we don't serve a wishy-washy kind of God. We serve a God who is committed to the end and, and through his Holy Spirit will just continue to work on us. Aren't you thankful that God works on us and that God moves on us? And that he doesn't, for, he, doesn't, he doesn't just write us off when we fail. That he gives us chances and chances and chances and chances and more chances. And then when it feels like we've exhausted all of our chances, God gives us more chances because he's faithful and he's committed to us. And so I think to myself, he, he was all... He was all in. Jesus was all in. On the cross, he was all in. When Jesus, my Savior, was strong enough and big enough and bad enough, he could have dispatched 10,000 angels to destroy those Roman soldiers. He was God. Get this. Fully God, fully man. He could have easily destroyed those people who hung him on that cross. They were nothing for him. But your Bible says that he went to the cross not saying a word. I have to tell you this morning that the reason why Jesus kept his mouth shut was because he was committed. Ah, the power of a made-up mind. Jesus had a, really, Jesus had a made-up mind that Friday morning, he was all in and he was committed. He knew what was going to happen and he was more than willing to go through what happened because we were on his mind. And I don't know about you, but that makes me want to be committed to him. If he's so committed to me, then I want to be that committed to him. A dude that'll stick with me through thick and thin. Jesus be my ride or die. Who was willing to accept all of my sin and all of my shame and all of my iniquity and all of my transgressions and all of my perversion and all of my poverty and all of my sickness and all of my disease and all of my funk and all the stuff in my trunk. Come on, somebody. He was willing to overlook that and go to the cross and bear it on the cross for me. And if he can be commit that committed to me, then surely I can be that committed to him. And if he asked me to do something, <laughs> if he asked me to do something, boy, howdy, I'm going to do it. Because he's been faithful to me. And the least I can do is to be faithful to him. Father, in the name of Jesus, I love you. And I thank you, Jesus, for your commitment this week of Holy Week on the cross for us. You were committed and you went all the way through. And on the third day, you rose again. 
Why? Because you are committed. And I just got to take a little time out right now to say thank you. Thank you for your commitment to me. Thank you, Jesus, for your commitment to me to die on the cross for my sins, to die on the cross for my shame, to die on the cross for my issues, to give me new life, to give me hope, to change my address for eternity. To give me assurance of salvation that when I breathe my last breath on earth, my next breath will be in heaven with you. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Lord, thank you for being committed to us. Now, Lord, I ask that we could be committed to you. Maybe you're here with your heads bowed. Maybe you're here under the sound of my voice. Maybe you're watching me today on social media. And you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You've never committed yourself fully to him. And through this preaching, through this atmosphere this morning, you would say, Pastor, that is me. I need to commit my heart. I need to commit my life to Jesus Christ. I realize that he was committed to me and I need to be committed to him. If that's you right where you are, right where you're sitting, I'm not going to call you forward this morning. There's too many people in this building. But I'm just going to ask you this morning, if you're here and you'd say, Pastor, that is me. I need to commit my life to Jesus this morning. Would you just pop up your hand right where you are? Thank you. Right where you are. Go ahead. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? There's 10. There's 11. There's 12. I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. You. We're just going to pray this, this commitment prayer huh, and ask Jesus to come into our heart and change our lives. And oh my God, he's going to. I told somebody last week when they, they came to my office and accepted Jesus, I said, uh-oh, you better watch out. He's going to change your life. He's going to rock your world. Uh, oh, it's going to be good. So those of you that raised your hands and those who are watching, I just want you to, to pray this simple prayer with me. The whole church is going to help you pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. And help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you see that? So listen, so I, I have a couple I have a couple more things. I gotta say something to you. We're gonna have communion in just a moment. And and but but I got I got to tell you those of you that raised your hands this morning that was the most significant thing you could ever do in your entire life is accept Jesus Christ as your savior. Somebody recently told me they said pastor how come we don't see miracles in the church any longer? No, we saw 12 miracles this morning. Come on somebody. Come on somebody. And so 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 listen, I need something from you. Those of you that those of you that raised your hands and those of you who didn't, I'm going to ask something. I'm going to ask something of you. And it's a big ask. I'm going to ask you to give me six months of your life. It'll work. Because listen, because listen, because because listen, and, 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 I, and I'm serious. The reason why I'm asking you to give me six months of your life, come to come to church and watch Jesus change your life. Yeah. Because because listen. 
when you when you start when you get married you don't just do the act of marriage and then go back to your house and never talk to them again in fact while you're dating hopefully you guys are communicating and talking and you're continuing to go out on dates come on somebody and 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 you cultivate that relationship and then you learn how to fall in love with that person well, hopefully you're not falling in love because if you can fall in, you can fall out. But, but, but when you get committed, listen, when you get committed to that person, you have to cultivate that relationship. And the only way that you can convoke, can, can commit that relationship and, and cultivate that relationship is if you learn what God has to say to you and about you. And so come on Sunday mornings, come on Wednesday nights. It, we don't even have Sunday night anymore, so you can have Sunday night off. But listen, but listen, I need six months of your life, and I'll give you tools, and I'll give you resources, and I'll give you, I'll give you scriptures, and watch God change your life. Besides, what six months? Six months in the scheme of things is nothing. But if you will give me six months, I will give you a money back guarantee. God will change your life. Has anybody's life been changed? Come on. And and it's it's cultivating, it's cultivating that. And so if you just come once, or if you just come every now and then, you're not just gonna go home every now and then when you get married. If you do, you won't be married for long. Come on. And so so what you do is you've got to get committed to the process. That's right. You got to get committed to the process. So I'm going to ask you, I'm not trying to build my church. If you want to go somewhere else, go somewhere else. There's lots of churches in this town who are great. There's lots of wonderful churches in this town and, 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 you, and you'll find, hopefully you'll find what you're looking for. But I'm asking, I'm asking, you came here this morning. You give me six months. You give me six months and watch God change your life. Listen, listen. We, 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 we're, we're weird around here. Listen, 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 I'm the pastor. Listen, I listen, 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 Linda. I'm the pastor. I'm the pastor that gives you a money back guarantee on your tithes. Yeah. Amen. Because I teach tithing and I teach giving in our church. And I teach this principle that if you pay your tithes for three months and, and you don't feel like God is blessing you in the area of your giving, I'll give it back to you plus interest. Yeah. It got quiet. Because there ain't no pastor in this town that's going to put his money where his mouth is. But listen, I have done this. Listen, I've served God for 30 years. I've served God for close to 30 years and I've tried his word and I've tested it and it's true. And I know, and I know that if you commit yourself to the process, God will change your life. If you commit yourself to his process and you do what his word says, he will change your life. I'm not talking about some nasty, stuffy old religion. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus. And oh my God, if you want a stuffy old time religion, this place is not for you. But if you want to be free and you want to be confronted, and you want a pastor who will love you and you want somebody who was going to tell you the truth, even when it don't feel good. Cause sometimes y'all I'm like a cupcake and sometimes y'all I'm like sandpaper. They're both good at their time. Sometimes you need a cupcake, but sometimes honey, you need some sandpaper cause you've got some edges that need to be knocked off. And a pastor will tell you the truth. And so, so listen, I, I'm kind of playing with you this morning, but, but if you commit yourself to the process, what I'm saying is, listen to my heart. If you commit yourself to the process, God will change your life. And it'll be sweet and it'll be good and it'll be worth it. And you'll look at me like so many people have when I've asked them to give me six months. They're like, oh my God, where is it? I told Paul to give me six months and Paul's been here for years now. Paul won't leave. Paul won't leave. And out of his own mouth, what'd you say? It's changed my life. And is listen. And 
And listen, as your pastor, I want to see God change your life. Because he's changed mine. Can I talk to somebody? Come on. Oh, I got to quit. I was 18 years old. I was in Mesquite Elementary School at 1045 in the morning, that early July, 1995. At Calvary Chapel Church, David Landry was the pastor. He stood up and he gave an altar call just like I did a little bit ago and said, if you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you raise your hand? And I was three rows back and five, five seats in. And I raised my hand and I accepted Jesus as my Savior there in 1995. And I've never been the same. Thank you. I've never been the same. He's changed my life. I, I, was, I, was able, I was able to lead a bunch of people. I've led thousands of people to Jesus all over the world. And one of the biggest ministries I've ever had in my life was I got to, I got to help lead my wife, who was my best friend at the time, who would later become my wife. And who's now become Pastor Greta, and she's led hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women to the Lord. And Amen. We've seen thousands of people come, come to know Jesus as their Savior, and I've seen it, and it works, y'all. And so I'm asking you on this Easter to examine your heart. It's not just about the eggs and it's not just about coming and doing duty for Easter. Sometimes I get a little, sometimes I get a little jaded about Easter because we plan and we prepare and we do all this and, and the house is packed. And I love seeing, I love preaching to a house, a, a house that's packed like this morning. We have very few chairs left. But I got to tell you where my heart is. My heart's not for crowds. I'm more concerned where you're going to be next Sunday. Amen. I'm concerned more about your, com your commitment next Sunday then quite frankly, I am your commitment on this Sunday. Is that all right? Yeah. Because probably every church in this town today is packed. And crowds really don't mean anything. But I want to know individually where you are, we are next Sunday. Will you be committed? Will you be committed to Jesus next Sunday? And the Sunday after that? And the Sunday after that? And the Sunday after that? Because the cross hasn't changed. Jesus, Jesus is not changing next Sunday morning. I hope you hear my heart. I've laughed. I've joked with you. I've been silly up here. But I want you to hear my heart. Where are you going to be next Sunday morning? First Corinthians chapter 11. Paul gives instructions to a newly formed church. And he institutes the Last Supper, and he is talking about the Last Supper that he has, that Jesus had with his disciples. And he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep or have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him have breakfast at the church before church. Hey. Lest you come together for judgment and I will set the rest in order when I come. And so he gives this instruction and he's saying, listen, before you take communion, before you take the last supper, you need to examine your heart and make sure that your heart is right before God. Because that's why there are many people who are sick because they're or, or have died because they're taking this in an unworthy manner. So I'm going to have you bow your heads just for a moment. And we're going to take a time and we're going to repent. Because we want to take communion. And, and he says that we need to examine our hearts. But also, this communion is going to be open for everybody. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior... Even if you did it this morning for the first time, then you can take communion this morning. I just ask, that's the only requirement that I have, is that, that, is that you must accept Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior in order to take communion, because I don't want you to take it in an unworthy way. So, so Lord, today we have our heads bowed, and we ask you, Lord, corporately and individually, that you would examine our hearts, God. Lord, if there's any sin in our life, in our heart, in our minds, any action, any deed, anything, God, that we've done that hasn't pleased you, Lord, forgive us right now in the name of Jesus. Right where you're sitting this morning, would you just, would you just search your heart this morning? Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. there's anything, God, that separates me from you this morning, any sin, any shame, forgive me, oh God. I want to take this communion in a worthy way. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything, God, that causes, causes harm, causes pain, separates me from you. I realize, God, that my sin separates me from you. I realize, God, also that your word declares that though my sins were as scarlet, you've washed me white as snow. I realize, God, that your word says that if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I repent right now in Jesus' name, and I ask you to forgive me. Forgive us in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. If I could have Barbara and Blue. <clears throat> and if I could have, is Rudy, Rudy, would you come? Or whatever you like to do. Like to line, right? To line, to line. Yeah. And Michael, can I have you come? Just make two lines. So this is what I'm going to do. We're going to take communion together. Scripture says there in First Corinthians chapter eleven that we're going to wait together, and and this is going to take a minute, but it's okay. He's worth waiting for. And so. So if you will, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, um, uh, take a piece of the bread, take a, take a cup, 
and then go back to your seat and do not take it till we all have it together. And then we'll pray and we'll all take it together. Is that okay? And would you do me one more, would you do me one more favor? We, we do communion about twice a year here. We do it very rarely at our church for a purpose. Is I believe that this is one of the most holy times and one of the most sacred times that we could have as a church body. Some churches do it weekly. Some churches do it monthly. Some churches do it quarterly. I do it very rarely because, because I want it to be special. Right. And I want it to be a holy moment because, because the, the bread is symbolic of, of the body that was broken for us on the cross when he was beaten for us and hung on that cross. Of course, we know that the, the cup is symbolic. It's red and it's symbolic of the blood that was shed on the cross at Calvary for our sins. And I don't want to, I don't ever want to take that lightly. And so when you're coming up and you're, and you're grabbing the cup and you're grabbing the bread, can we do it in virtual silence? Could we just, as a holy moment, just as a solemn moment, could we just keep our conversations down and focus on the Lord for just a little bit? Could we do that?